It was a little bit over two years ago that I started working at the Riverside Mission. I uh, felt the Lord telling me to that He would like me to use my gifts that He had given me in my art to bless the people there. And so that's what I did. I started uh, showing up and sketching people uh, as they sat around and ate and listened to the message. Uh, and it was there that I met Denali. Um, I walked up from, be I had been out to take some food to a lady and we came back into the park and he was standing there and I just felt the Lord saying, this is who I want you to draw next. And um, he, I just can't tell you, it was perfect. Um, I went over and talked to him and happened to sneak a photo of him because I draw from photos that he didn't know that I was doing that. I don't think anyway. But, <laughs> um, so I talked to him for a little bit, trying to get to know him, so I could try to put some of his personality into the photograph, into his picture. Hi, I'm Denali. Um, before I got a place here, I lived in my car for the better part of eight years. Part of that was uh, living in checking out the national parks and taking lots of photos and trying to make the best of the situation. And then when I came here, it was quite amazing. Um, Judy approached me one day and she gave me this photo that she sketched of me. It was just so amazing. Uh, uh, I can't even talk about it without crying or shedding a tear because it means so much to me. This last winter I've been really depressed and that really, it really helped a lot. Um, and just, just seeing her and, and just being able to give her a hug and, and tell her I really appreciate her and I do love her. They're amazing people that show up every Sunday at the park and, and I look forward to going there every Sunday. It's just it's just a wonderful experience. And something that, It's a bright spot in my week, I know the people really care, and I just can't say enough good about them. Uh, but all I know is God is good, and He's there when when we need Him. He's there all the time. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and whoever lives and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Good morning. And it's great to have you here. Uh, my name is Kirk Yamaguchi. And I get to have an amazing blessing to be able to serve here as one of the pastors of this amazing church because you guys are here. So uh, anyway, before I move forward, I do want to make a quick announcement that we have a new class that's starting on Wednesday night, April 10th, and it's called Crash Course. And we are replacing what we've done traditionally with Gateway with this new class crash course. So if you are new to the church um, or if you haven't been to Gateway, I really recommend that you come to this uh, class. And it's just one night. And what we're going to talk about is who we are as a church and what our vision is and, and what we're going to move forward towards. And because I really do believe that the church that the Lord puts you in needs to be a church that has the same vision that you do. And if this church doesn't have the vision or the means for how we're reaching uh, people for, for Christ's sake, um, we would love to help you to find what church that is. Because we believe in the Big C Church, that we are just one of the church. And um, 
we want everybody in a church that is meeting their needs, but also a church where you can serve and grow with that church together. So please come, uh, 6.30, and if you are coming, please register, pre-register on our website, because we're going to cook you a luscious meal, and we need to know how much food to prepare. Okay. So going into the message today about being like Jesus, we really are looking at this from the life of Christ, of what he is modeling to us about how to engage with and uh, to transform the world. Because I really do believe that um, if this church and the other churches in this valley don't start or don't continue to live missionally, the church is going to die. Because the culture is so opposed to everything that we're about. And it's up to us to go into the world, to live missionally, to bring transformation in individual lives. And when we all do that together, individually and corporately, I believe we can see a significant move of God here in the Grand Valley. So come and be a part of this with us. But how do we do it? Because when we talk about living missionally and kind of the Christianese word is do evangelism. Most of us, if we're really honest, when we start talking about evangelism, uh, we kind of shy away from that, don't we? We have so many reasons why it's very difficult for us to live a missional life. Some of us may think, oh, I, j- I just don't know enough. I-, I can't get into an argument with the person and convince them that they're wrong and they should follow Jesus because I don't know enough. By the way, I don't think that's the right way to evangelize these days anyway. The other thing that many of us have uh, a feeling of, well, you guys are the paid guys. You're the ones that are supposed to be doing this. And no, no, we're your coach. We're here to train and equip the saints to do the work of the kingdom. That's uh, what Paul talks about in Ephesians 4. And uh, others, we've experienced rejection that people just slam the gospel in our face. And so when we have that done, it, it kind of is hurtful. And so we retract back and we say, well, I'll leave the evangelism to those that have the gift of evangelism. But Paul does say everyone should do the work of an evangelist, every one of us. But you may not know this, God is using you in the lives of others in spite of us. And one of the things that came out a few years ago, it's by a guy named Engel, is he developed what is called the Engel's Scale of Evangelism. And when I saw this for the first time, it really kind of freed me up. So Engel's scale, oops, that should be knee. I'm still learning English. Engel's scale of evangelism. When I, when I understood this concept, it really gave me freedom and helped me to relax. Because um, I know people that they'll meet anybody, anywhere, and within five minutes, they have that person on their knees giving their life to Christ. You know, do you know people like that? It's like, that ain't me. And so I'm going to illustrate this with this graph. In the middle here, ultimately, the goal is to lead people to Christ. And through the cross, people come to understand that they are a sinner, meaning that they have rebelled against God. Because of that, there's this giant chasm that man can't bridge between us and God. But God came to us, and because of what he did for us on the cross through sending his son Jesus to die for us on the cross, that he was sinless, became sin on our behalf, so that we can become the righteousness of God. And so through faith in Christ, 
we come to a relationship with God because all sin is wiped away and now we can have access, free access to God, a holy and awesome God. Okay, now, so where we kind of have fallen into a trap, and I know this is me, is if I don't lead someone to Christ in my encounter with them, I failed, right? No is right. This is what Ingle is talking about. Now, obviously, when a person comes to Christ, they go through a process of discipleship where as we grow and mature to Christ, we're becoming more and more like Jesus. But there are people that are as far away from Jesus as can be. They don't think about Jesus. They don't want to think about Jesus. They don't care about Jesus. How many of us know people like this? Yeah. And so what Engel says is really the goal of any believer is we want to move people a step closer to Jesus. We all are living in this success-oriented culture, so we feel like if I don't lead him to Christ, you know, like we failed, but are we leading them a step closer to Jesus? Are we turning them to Jesus, but they're still far, far away? But if we've done that, God has used us tremendously. And Paul talks about this very thing in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6, where he said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives growth. So the reality is, is I can't lead anybody to Christ. God does the work through the Holy Spirit, but he just uses us to get people closer. Now, sometimes we get to experience the blessing of, of the fruit of the seeds that have been planted in people's lives over the years, and we get to pray with them to receive Christ. That is a wonderful thing. We may be involved in uh, baptizing them and then helping discipleship, disciple them to grow in Christ. That is a great blessing. We can't discount the impact that you have had in people's lives by you just loving them, to be like Jesus in love. So love is really about relationships. God calls us to enter into personal relationships with people to love them and to support them and walk with them to help them make steps closer to Jesus. Now, we're going to look at the account of Christ in John 11. This is now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And that's, that's a powerful statement where they're saying, he whom you love. Meaning they had relationship already. There was a previous encounter in Luke 10, verse 38, where Jesus entered into Bethany, and Martha invited him into the home, and was having a party for Jesus. And um, in verse 39 of Luke 10, it says, And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. So there was that relationship already. So they sent word to Jesus in verse 3 of John 11, Lord, he whom you love is ill. John eleven five 5, it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He had relationship. He loved them. Now, this word love comes from the Greek word agapeo. Now, what this, the best way for me to describe this love, because this is affectionate love. This is like where we are just so uh, 
emotionally attached to a person out of love. And the um, best way I can describe it is when Jane became pregnant with our oldest son, Wade, immediately Jane developed a got pay a love for Wade. She uh, eventually felt him move. She could just feel that life growing within her and her heart was totally engaged with Wade. Now for me, now guys, if this is you, please support me in this, okay? So I was like, yeah, you're pregnant. Yeah, we're going to have a kid. I can't believe I'm going to be a dad. This poor kid, he's going to have me for a dad. But I just didn't have that connection with Wade. I knew he was growing in her womb. You could see it. But I didn't have that emotional connection until Wade was laid in my arms. And all of a sudden, my heart opened up where I said, Lord, I'll take a bullet for this young guy. You see, that's agape love. And just like Jesus had agape love for Mary and Martha and Lazarus, in this moment of crisis, in this moment of darkness, Jesus loved them agapeo, compassionate love. That same love is the love that God has for everyone in this room. Because you're his. You're his child. He holds you in his arms right now. And he says, you are mine. That's the love that God has for everyone here. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, and no matter what you didn't do that you know you should have, God's agape love is for you. And God's love desires the best for others. This is interesting. In this account, what happens is Jesus delays going to Bethany. And in the meantime, Lazarus dies. And I don't understand this. Why does God withhold his hand at times? Why do some people get miraculously healed, where all cancer is gone, and they live a long, full life afterwards? But others are tragically taken. Why? Where were you, God? Why did you withhold your hand from us where you're blessing this other family that I know of? It's a difficult question, isn't it? Jesus could have done what he did in Luke 7. This Roman uh, soldier, he was a centurion, meaning he was over a 100 men. And his servant became ill, and he sent word, or he went to Jesus himself and said, I know you can heal my servant. And listen to what Jesus says in Luke 7. He said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when these who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Instantly, Jesus healed the sick servant. The same thing happens here in John 11. Martha sends somebody to go tell Jesus, hey, Lazarus is ill. You better get here, Lord. And the Lord doesn't do it. He doesn't respond. He lets Lazarus die. And I know there are many in this room that you've been in the same shoes of Mary and Martha. Why does a loving God allow those we love to experience something like they've gone through or are in the midst of right now? And you may be thinking, I'm in the midst of this, Lord, and where are you? That is a human emotion that is real. It's a real situation that we all face in our human existence. 
Why is there suffering? Why is there disease? Why is there pestilence, pestilence and famine? Why is there war? Why are lives innocently taken? It's a good question because that's reality, isn't it? Where is God in the midst of that? And we can't forget the overlap of the two kingdoms that we live with in the midst of this tension of two kingdoms right now. We have the kingdom of darkness that came in Genesis through original sin. We see this in Genesis 3.17. After Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, they rebelled against God. They did what they wanted to do so that they could become gods themselves. And we have all done the same thing. We may not have eaten the forbidden fruit, but you wanted to be the God of your life because you don't want anyone else to control your life including God. That's sin. That's the root of sin. And so, and to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Because of our rebellion against God, death enters in. That's the reality that we all face. But Jesus gives us a hint here. In verse 4 of John 11, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Why does God allow suffering in our lives to bring glory to himself? That doesn't seem fair. Does it? Isn't God supposed to coddle us? Isn't God supposed to protect us? Isn't God supposed to make us feel happy and joyful all the time? Why does this stuff happen? It's because we live in this tension between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light that came in through Christ. So there are times right now in this tension, God does heal, and God brings deliverance, and God rescues us. But there are other times, he withholds his hand, but he's working. Even though you're in the midst of some crisis right now, God is with you. You may not feel it, you may not see him, but someday, hold on to Jesus He's going to reveal to you how he's bringing glory to himself through your situation. One of the blessings of being a pastor, being a pastor for almost 22 years, I can't believe it, is the Lord gives me a gift of relationships with certain people where they open their hearts of their family up to me and I get to experience a kiss from heaven from them. And over the years, over the last 22 years, Jane and I were talking about this. There's probably six to ten women that have left uh, an eternal impression on me that I will never, ever forget them because of how God used them to show me his love in a way that I've never seen before. They just were full of Jesus. They just love people. I know they prayed for me. Literally, when you know people say, I'll pray for you, you go, okay, thank you. And you walk away and you go, they're never going to pray for me. You know, but these women I know loved me and prayed for me. Muriel Morley is one of them. 
2013, Muriel, precious woman, her and Steve involved in this church for years. She was diagnosed with a progressively debilitating brain disease. Very rare brain disease. I'm not even going to try to uh, say what it is because it's all Greek to me. And then three years ago, Muriel was placed in a care center because of the challenges of how the disease was taking her body. And dear Steve, God bless you, Steve. He's here. Where are you, Steve? He's right here. Steve loved Muriel to the end. He was faithful to his vows to his wife until death do you part. He cared for her every day. But in the midst of this, in the midst of Muriel having this debilitating disease, it was an ugly process. Kim, their daughter, comes here from the East Coast to see her mom, and she didn't realize how serious it was. And then she felt like the Lord prompted her to move here and to help Steve take care of Muriel. But uh, I never heard the story till Kim told me this, that there was a history in this family. That when Kim was a senior in high school, well, go back beyond that. So Muriel gets married. She becomes pregnant, and her first husband gets killed in an accident. So she's a widow, young widow. She goes to school and meets Steve. They fall in love, and they get married. So Steve becomes the stepdad of Kim. But in the process, Kim never accepted Steve as her dad. And then, when she was a senior in high school, Steve has a business opportunity here in Grand Junction and moves the family here from Denver. So all of the friends that Kim had from kindergarten to 11th grade, she had to leave to come to Grand Junction. She said she came kicking and screaming, and she resented Steve for moving the family here. And she held on to this bitterness. And so when she came to see Muriel in the care center, Muriel, in her, I could just see her doing this with that loving look on her face, said, Kim, you need to forgive Steve. And she says, you need to forgive Steve, not for him, but for you. Because when you hold this unforgiveness and bitterness in your heart, it's killing you. And so all the time she would ask Kim when she came to see her, have you forgiven your dad yet? And so Kim walked into the house one day, and she saw Steve sitting there with a cat, their cat, on his lap, and he's petting the cat. You know, in my eyes, a guy that pets a cat has a special anointing that I don't have. I won't tell you what I would do to that cat. Forgive me, all you cat lovers. God bless you. You are God's children, too. But she said when she walked in, all of a sudden, the penny dropped. And all of a sudden, she realized, Steve cared for my mom her whole life. Steve built a ramp out in front of the house so that they can get the wheelchair into the house for Muriel. Steve fed Muriel. This is for six years. He cared for her. He changed her clothes. He bathed her. And all of a sudden, God gave her a heart for Steve. You see, it was through kindness of both Muriel and Steve, eventually Kim was able to come to this point of having a heart for her stepdad that transitioned to her dad at that moment. And she's committed to stay here and help him so that they can continue to finish life together. 
but Kim actually wrote a story about this, and it got published in this new book, Chicken Soup for the Soul, and it's titled Mom Knows Best. And um, so she has these books, and we're selling them in the bookstore, and she has marked on page 154, I don't have my reading glass. Yeah, 154, the story that she wrote that got published of this very topic, the power of forgiveness and love. And if you buy this book, the proceeds go to the hospice center for Hope West. So this is a very simple way that you can uh, have some support to uh, Hope West and also to read some very, very uh, touching stories in here about their children, stories about their moms. So when you, when you hear this, in the midst of Muriel's disease, God brings glory to himself by bringing forgiveness between Kim and Steve. I don't understand that. I don't get it. Couldn't God have just zapped Kim at one point and given her forgiveness? There's something about what we learn as we go through the process. As we go through the process of those moments of darkness, the Holy Spirit is working within us, and he's transforming us, and he's pointing our eyes to him. That's how he brings glory to himself. And I have to go to Isaiah 55, 8, where he said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, we can't play God. And we have to trust in the sovereignty of God that in any one of our situations, in those darkest moments, God's ways are higher than ours. I can't understand it. I can't figure it out. But later, we see the glory of God. And here's the deal. Love goes. In John eleven seven, it says, Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go up to Judea again. Now, this is uh, important because this is right before Jesus gets arrested. So the tension between Jesus and the religious leaders is at an epic crisis, at a level that they want to literally kill Jesus. And so his disciples are going, dude, why are you going to go back to Judea when they're all out to kill you? Jesus had a deeper purpose in mind. And as he goes there, Jesus says in verse uh, 9, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. He's, you know, it's kind of a powerful way that he's telling the disciples, you guys, not a, you got to stop looking at things from a human perspective. When you do that, you're walking in darkness, and you're just going to continue to stumble along. But when you look at things in the light, the light of the kingdom of God, and you allow God to be God, even in your darkest situation, you will begin to start having clarity. That's what Jesus is saying here. And he said in verse 11, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I will go awake him. So the disciples go, well, dang, if he's sleeping, just he'll wake up. But then Jesus says, verse 13, now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Wow, for your sake, he died? Was it our fault? Is it my sin that caused it? Is it my unbelief that caused someone to die? No, no. What, what Jesus is saying to these guys is, his death is going to do something in you. 
Because here's the deal. In just a few days, Jesus would be arrested. He'd be tried. He'd be whipped. He'd be hanging on a cross. The disciples would scatter in fear. In the midst of that, God gave them this situation as a gift to give them faith to keep going when it seems like all is lost. They remembered that when Jesus was crucified, they remembered Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and we're going to wait and see if God raises Jesus from the dead. He gave them faith. They went and hid, yes, but God came through. Three days later, Jesus rose from the grave. This is what Jesus had to give to the disciples. Man, if they didn't have that, you can bet, knowing human nature, knowing the way we were, or we are, they would have scattered forever. But they stayed close enough. They stayed in Jerusalem. They waited for the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came in Acts 2, the kingdom of God exploded in their lives. You see, so just like Jesus communicated love by going to Lazarus and to Mary and Martha, we go to a broken and fallen world. It, through our relationships, we enter into people's crisis, and we love them, we serve them, we care for them, and it moves them a step closer to Jesus. But we got to get out of the way. Love gets out of the way. We love to be in control don't we? And so we want to fix, especially guys, when there's a problem, automatically we think of how are we going to fix it. But what love does is it allows God to do what God wants to do into a situation. Sometimes the Holy Spirit just tells us to step back, that God's doing something in them. Sometimes he sends us in. We have to listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit so that out of love, we're allowing God to do what he wants to do in people's situations. In verse 14, it said, Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. God's building faith in us all the time. And I don't understand why, but it seems like faith deepens the most when we're in crisis. I don't get it. And to be honest, I don't like it. It would be so much easier if God did it the easy way and just took all our problems away. And so love basically brings hope. There's love in hope. When Jesus comes to Bethany, his sister Martha comes to him, and she says in verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. It's kind of like a manipulation she's doing there. You know? Well, I know you, you could heal him if you just said the word. You could raise him, Lord. Lord, if you had been here. How many times have we said that? Lord, if you had been in this situation, this wouldn't have happened. Lord, you promised this, but why is this happening? Where are you, Lord? Where did you go? And Martha, in her pain, she's kind of spanking Jesus. You know, Lord, if you would have come when we gave you a message, we wouldn't be in this situation. But in verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus was telling Martha, Martha, the key issue is not the resurrection of Lazarus. The key issue is me. I am the resurrection. I am the life. And in every crisis, in every moment of darkness of our life, what God is doing is he's drawing us deeper to him. That he wants us to see Jesus even in the midst of our crisis. And through the resurrection of Lazarus, that is a picture of what would eventually happen with Jesus, that through the resurrection of Christ, we know that we know that we know that this life is not all there is. That we have the kingdom of heaven that we have, and we press forward for that, and we want to bring as many people with us into that relationship with Christ so that they have hope in a world that is living in darkness and hopelessness. It's in Jesus. He is the resurrection and the life. And so I want to invite the, the ministry team up. I mean the worship team. I'm just getting a little worked up here. And what we see is love enters into others' pain. There, some of you, like myself, people say you have the gift of mercy. And so when I see people crying, I'm crying. And uh, in verse 33, it says, When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And then he says, where have they laid him? And when he saw Mary, Mary said the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, we wouldn't be in this situation. And it says when Jesus saw Mary weeping and those around weeping, it says Jesus wept. Jesus knew Lazarus was going to be raised from the dead. Why did he cry? I'd be laughing. Oh, you guys ain't seen nothing yet. But what Jesus is doing is he has empathy for those he loves. He knows your pain. If you've been crying, if you've been weeping, if you've been mourning, Jesus has been crying and weeping and mourning with you. But then he says, hey, taps us on the shoulder, and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Turn to me, follow me, and that's where we find hope. Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. That, my friends, is when we step into people's worlds and we have this kind of compassion and this kind of heart, the kingdom just moves through us into the lives of others. That's what God calls us to. That's a missional life. And so as we come together in worship, we do this in response to what Christ has done for us. If you are in crisis right now, if you are in the midst of the darkest time of your life right now, I pray that God would give you hope and that he would reach down and tap you on the shoulder right now and say 